Good morning, and it's uh, good to be here again today. Um, if you have a Bible, we're going to just read a few verses from John chapter 2. We won't, we won't read the whole chapter. Uh, we'll read the starting at verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2. This is what it says. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And down to verse 18, it says there, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, because you know the truth, it, because you know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. And no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And that's the word of the Lord. We look to God to help us as we just speak on this chapter. The Apostle John wrote uh, this epistle towards the end of the first century. And some people believe this was the last book of the Bible ever to be written. The life and times of Jesus of Nazareth was 60 or 70 years ago. And it's beginning to slip from living memory. John is an old man. Probably in his 80s, maybe even into his early 90s. He is the last of the apostles, possibly the last remaining eyewitness of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And the church is about to move into what is called the post-apostolic era. And in that era there will be no one with the, that authoritative perspective on the life of Jesus Christ that John could bring to any situation in the church. There was no one who had actually heard Jesus Christ speak and could give that eyewitness account. And as you read this letter, you get the sense that John has a real concern for the believers that are going to be carrying the torch of Christian witness into the subsequent generation and centuries. When John has gone, the only authoritative word that the church is going to have is the scriptures, including the writings of the apostles. That's all we've got. John was aware that there were difficulties emerging. And we'll come to some of these shortly. And as he writes to these Christians, considerably younger than himself, you get the sense that that weight of responsibility is really beginning to weigh heavily on his shoulders. And his message is profoundly simple. Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. Come to earth as a real man to deal with our sin at the cross. And the result of embracing this message is that our lives will be characterized by a practical down-to-earth love for our fellow man and a wholehearted devotion to God. That's essentially John's message. The first two verses says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but 
If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only us, but also for the sins of the whole world. Many of us drive motor cars. <clears throat> we expect a motor car to get us reliably from where we are to wherever we want to go to. To be reasonably sure that that happens, we get it serviced, we put fuel in the tank, we put air in the tires. But just in case something goes wrong, we get breakdown recovery with the AA. There are other organisations who do provide breakdown recovery. So if our car breaks down, we have access to assistance that will get us on our way again. Part of the reason for John writing this epistle was to make sure that his readers got a regular spiritual service, that the spiritual fuel tank was filled with fuel, and that they had spiritual air in their tires to minimize the likelihood of breakdown. Spiritual breakdown. In other words, them falling into sin. But in the event that this isn't sufficient and that we do break down and we fall into sin, John says, remember this, you have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, we have an advocate with the Father, we have a lawyer. Now I know I'm mixing metaphors here, but try and hold this together in your mind. The picture that John here is painting is this, that Christians are being accused by Satan of sin before the Father, God the Father. He is the judge. Jesus Christ is our defense lawyer. The Christian, maybe you, you're in the dock. The accusation is brought before you and you're asked, how do you plead? The advice of John from the, first, from the first chapter is this, you admit your guilt <clears throat> if we confess our sins. So our response is, we are guilty. <clears throat> the sentence is read, <clears throat> the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> Our advocate approaches the bench and says to the judge, charge it to my account. I paid the price in my blood at Calvary. <clears throat> There's a song that we sometimes sing. <clears throat> Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love ever lives and pleads for me. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. The next verse goes on. This verse is tremendous. Because my sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. Get a hold of that verse. Whoever that writer was, he got it just absolutely right. God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. It's nothing that you do, it's nothing you can do. A just God looks on Jesus Christ and says, I am completely satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary on account of your sin. And I'm prepared, I am willing to forgive. The breadth of the gospel is this, that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and in that sacrifice that is sufficient for the whole world. John says he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, those believers, but for the sins of the whole world. 
That takes a lot of getting our heads around. That forgiveness, that salvation becomes effective for us when by faith we confess our sin to God and believe that on the cross Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sin. The question that John then goes on to address is how do we know that this transaction or this salvation is real for me as an individual? <clears throat> Verses 3 to 6 says this, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love truly is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Now consider this. <clears throat> do you breathe because you are alive? Or are you alive because you breathe? That one takes some thinking about. Do you breathe because you are alive? Or are you alive because you breathe? Breathing is evidence that we are alive. With the Christian life, we keep His commandments because we are alive. Doing as we are commanded in the Bible, as walking as Jesus walked, is the evidence that we are Christians. A person claiming to be a Christian and living their lives with a complete disregard to what the Bible says is pretty much the same as somebody claiming to live and doesn't breathe. The evidence that we are believers in Jesus Christ is that we live as he did. If you are a Christian, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, that will affect the way you live. That's inevitable. We now come to some of the difficulties that John saw coming over the horizon in the end of the first century. There were people claiming to have superior knowledge. <clears throat> Wesley, I think, mentioned the last one, they're called Gnostics. It was a curious mixture of Christianity and Greek philosophy. And when it was distilled down to its essentials, it was saying that it's only that which is spiritual is of any consequence. And they concluded that Jesus Christ was not a real man, but he only gave the appearance of being a real person. The other outcome of this superior knowledge was that how we live in this life is not so important, but what really mattered was acquiring this superior knowledge. John meets these two issues head on in the rest of this chapter. Does it really matter how we live? And is the man Jesus of Nazareth the Christ as was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures? In other words, is he God in human form? That were the two issues that John was addressing here. He goes on in verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new commandment as we address does it really matter how we live. I'm not writing a new commandment, but an old one which you have heard, had since the beginning. The old commandment is the message you have heard. I am writing you a new commandment, however. His truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Well, whoever lives, loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. John here homes in the second of the two great commandments. The first one was love God. The second was love your neighbor as yourself. And John is saying it is essential that we love. That love characterizes us as believers in Jesus Christ. 
Remember, John has spent time with Jesus Christ, and he can't recall the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus said, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. If you love the people that you that love you, you're no different from what Jesus called the tax collectors. The lowest strata, the lowest form of society. You're no better than them if you only love the people who love you. Jesus says you've got to love your enemies, those who despise you. Jesus Christ in his life brought that command into sharp focus. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, said this in chapter 5, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said to his followers, I am the light of the world as long as I am in the world. But he also says to them, you are the light of the world. Today, according to what Jesus Christ says, he is not the light of the world because he's no longer in the world. We are. We have got to shine a light in this dark world that we are living in. There is darkness around us. There's hatred around us. And John is saying to these early Christians in that first century, he's saying to us through his word, you've got to love. You've got to shine that light. Because if you don't, there'll be utter darkness out there. Paul in 2 Corinthians said, For God has said, Let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. If we don't shine the light, there will be utter darkness out there. The instructions of Jesus to his followers was to love like he loves. Today we are Jesus Christ's representatives in this world. And Jesus said, not by your doctrine, not by your piety, not by your condemnation of everything that is wrong, will people know that you are my disciples. None of these things. That didn't feature. Jesus said, by your love will people know that you are my disciples, that you are my representatives here on earth. Mahatma Gandhi, the father of modern day India, is reported to have said, if it weren't for Christians, I would be a Christian. That's some indictment on the Christians that Gandhi knew. May it never be said of us by anybody. I wouldn't be a Christian except I know so and so. And if that's what Christianity is about, I want nothing to do with it. The challenge that John is putting out to these early Christians and us today make sure that the thing that characterizes our life is that of love. In verses 9 to 11, John uses extreme language to get his point across. It says, if you hate your brother, you're walking in darkness and you don't know where you're going. But if you love your brother, you're walking in light. For John, there wasn't any middle ground. You either love or you hate. I believe the figure of speech is hyperbole. But John is doing that to emphasize and bring into sharp relief, into sharp focus. We've got to love. 
In verses 15 to 17, John gives us the negative aspects of these truths. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the, world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. <clears throat> In these verses, John isn't talking about planet Earth in which we live. The word that John uses for the world is the word cosmos. That is the Greek word from which we get our word cosmetics. And to a large extent, cosmetics has got to do with presenting an image rather than the reality. I'm not saying that's what women do when they stand in front of a mirror with their cosmetics. It might be, I can comment. This, the world of the cosmetics, has got to do with how things are arranged and ordered. And here it is specifically referring to how things are arranged and presented to us so that they will appeal to us. So that it will appear to our basic appetites that are now twisted and deformed as a result of the fall and as a result of sin. I think you probably know what I'm talking about. We have got so many twisted appetites these days. That is the world out there. They take that which is beautiful and take something which has a prior claim upon it, namely the rainbow. That is God's covenant, the symbol of God's covenant promise to mankind. And they take it and twist it into something which is far from beautiful. That is the world. The world also refers to desires that are fueled by what we see <coughs> and not by what we need. What's the purpose of adverts on television or anywhere? It's to create a desire in you for something you don't need. So that you have a craving, a desire for it. And also the pride that we take in what we have that others don't have. You used to call it keeping up with the Joneses. Do you know what it's like? You've got to have the latest this, that and t'other. You've got to have everything that's just spot on, whether you need it or not. And people compare themselves with somebody else and think, well, if they've got that, I need to have it. All of that. That is the world. Christianity for so long, I've just totally messed up the concept of what the worldliness is. This is worldliness. And so much of it today is socially acceptable. None of it comes from God. It belongs to this present order of things. This is what's driving the world economy. This is what's underlying the tensions between nations. This is what's ruining families across this country today. And John says, have nothing to do with it. Do not love the world, it's transient, it's passing. C.T. Studd was a missionary to China in the late 1800s, he wrote this. <coughs> Two little lines I heard one day, travelling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. And these two lines are this. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. 
As believers, we've really got to make up our mind what's going to characterize our lives. Is it a love of the world? Or is it going to be a love for Christ? On to the next thing that John was addressing. Is the man Jesus of Nazareth the Christ that was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures? Is he God in human form? Verse 22 says, Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Right living is inseparable from right believing. And especially right believing concerning Jesus Christ. There's a lot out there that claims to be Christian. But when it's put under the microscope of the scriptures, it's found to be false. And almost invariably, they fail on one of the central truths of the Christian faith as we have it presented in the New Testament. And the one which comes top of the list is this. Is Jesus Christ the babe born in Bethlehem who became the man who died on the cross and who rose again on the third day? Is he the eternal God in human form? That is the central issue which faces so much as that is called cults today. Is Jesus Christ the eternal Son of God in human form. If that is denied, it is Antichrist. No matter what credentials a system of belief has, if it fails on this one item, it is Antichrist. Have nothing to do with it. Remember, John is an old man, the last of the apostles. And he gives them this warning out concerning Antichrist. And when you scan church history over the last 2,000 years, the thing that you see appearing time and time again is a group of people, often led by one individual, who rise to the surface and they deny that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That the man Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Son of God. This isn't just academic. If Jesus Christ is not Almighty God of eternity in human form, who also died on the cross bearing the sin of the world, there is no gospel, there is no salvation, there is no hope. It's a central issue. And John, towards the end of this epistle, <coughs> chapter 5, says this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So John was saying to these first century believers, <coughs> How you live is of vital importance. He was also saying what you believe concerning Jesus of Nazareth is also of vital importance. You can't have one without the other. The two sides to the same coin, they go together, you can never separate them. How you live and what you believe, both are of vital importance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we just pray now that you would help us to settle in our minds that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that we are going to allow that to affect the way that we live our lives here on this earth. Father, may you transform us and shape us into people who reflect Jesus Christ in increasing measure as we live our lives. Father, we ask this as we give you thanks. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.